very beginning, when we first open our eyes, our body begins to signal the brain for certain needs. One very early signal is the need for nourishment. The process of eating is an ongoing essential aspect of daily life. This need is so common that we eventually begin to take it for granted. Each time we eat, over 26 muscles and seven cranial nerves are used to swallow a bite of food or liquid and then effectively move that food or liquid from the mouth to the stomach. The ability to swallow safely allows us to enjoy social and cultural pleasures associated with food. This ability also provides our bodies with adequate nutrition and protects us against the risk of choking. When the normal swallowing process is impaired, whether by disease or injury, our health and well-being are at risk from an obstructed airway, aspiration pneumonia, and malnutrition. Today, we will review the normal swallow, causes associated with swallowing problems, warning signs, and general techniques to facilitate safe swallowing. Let's start with the normal swallowing process. Swallowing begins in the mouth and extends to the stomach. Body structures involved in the process are the mouth, pharynx, larynx, and esophagus. With normal swallowing, there are three recognized phases. The first phase is called the oral phase. In the oral phase, food is bitten, chewed, formed into a pasty ball, known as the bolus, and moved from the front to the back of the mouth. When the bolus reaches the back of the mouth, the bolus stimulates nerves that send signals to the brain to start muscle contractions. These contractions move the bolus into the pharynx. This causes the soft palate to lift and keeps food material from entering the nasal cavity. The second phase of swallowing is known as the pharyngeal phase. In this phase, the larynx moves up and forward, causing the epiglottis to lower and protect the airway or trachea. Additional protection occurs through vocal cord closure. This prevents food, liquid, or saliva from entering the trachea. The pharyngeal contractions push the bolus from the pharynx into the esophagus. Once the bolus is formed, the combination of the oral and pharyngeal phase takes approximately two seconds. The third phase is known as the esophageal phase. With this phase, muscle contractions continue to move the bolus through the esophagus into the stomach. So the normal swallowing process consists of three phases, oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal. When the ability to swallow is impaired, it is known as dysphagia. Dysphagia is not a disease in itself, but a symptom of many diseases and conditions. Dysphagia may be caused by impairment of the normal swallowing muscles or nerves. Any structural change of the swallowing tract may also cause this symptom. If not controlled, dysphagia may allow food, liquid, or saliva to enter the lungs, causing a condition known as aspiration. Any foreign substance in the lungs can lead to edema and or aspiration pneumonia. If untreated, this condition may lead to severe complications or even death. It is a normal reaction for us to cough when food or liquid enters the airway. In some people, this natural cough reaction is not present. This condition is known as silent aspiration. The causes of dysphagia are generally divided into three types, neurological, structural, and psychological. Neurological swallowing problems are the most common. A neurological swallowing problem is any disturbance in the neuromuscular system that affects the normal swallowing process. Symptoms may include muscle weakness or uncoordinated or inaccurate muscle movement. Neurological swallowing problems are associated with many different common ailments, they include cerebral vascular accidents or stroke, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, myasthenia gravis, muscular dystrophies, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Bell's palsy, cerebral palsy, AIDS, head and neck injuries, brain tumors, and circulatory disorders of the brain. A structural swallowing problem is an impairment or obstruction of the normal movement of food or liquid through the swallowing tract. 
Structural causes of dysphagia are esophageal stricture, esophageal diverticulum, also an abscess, edema, laryngectomy, tumor, carcinoma, tracheostomy tube, cervical spine displacement, and hiatal hernia. Psychological swallowing problems relate more to behavioral dysfunction than to a physical disturbance. Typically, a person with a psychological problem will show symptoms of loss of appetite or refusal to eat. A word of caution. An individual experiencing these symptoms should have a physical examination. It is possible that a previously undiagnosed physical problem may be causing this condition. There are many warning signs that can point to dysphagia. They include choking or coughing, during or after eating or drinking. But remember, coughing may not always be present. Silent aspiration is a good example. The poor ability or inability to hold, control, or chew solid food. Drooling, or the inability to keep liquids in the mouth. The inability to swallow food from the mouth, causing pockets of food to form in the patient's cheeks. A delayed or absent swallow response. Caregivers should observe the movement of the Adam's apple and notice the amount of time it takes an individual to eat a meal. Complaints of pain when swallowing. Complaints of food getting stuck. Wet, gurgling, or hoarse vocal qualities during or after eating or drinking. The inability to produce a vocal sound. Weight loss. And finally, frequent respiratory infections. What should you do if you notice a patient or family member with one or more of the above warning signs? If you suspect a swallowing problem, the primary physician should be informed immediately. The optimal approach to patient evaluation and management involves a multidisciplinary team. This team may include the patient and family members, as well as the primary physician, physician specialist, radiologist, speech language pathologist, nurses, nursing assistants, occupational therapist, and dietitian. A variety of tests can be performed to determine the nature of a patient's swallowing disorder. One common evaluation tool is a video fluoroscopy. A video fluoroscopy is an x-ray study of a patient's swallowing pattern, recorded on videotape. This process, often called a modified barium swallow, allows specialists to view the swallowing process as it occurs by having the patient eat various consistencies of food while the patient is situated in different positions. The use of video fluoroscopy identifies the location and nature of the swallowing problem while helping to determine whether food or liquid is entering the airway. This helps the team to design an individualized swallowing program that will improve the patient's swallowing and reduce the potential risk of aspiration. There are several general techniques that can help to improve the swallowing process and reduce the risk of aspiration in a patient with dysphagia. The multidisciplinary team will develop a safe swallowing plan that will address each individual's specific swallowing problem. There are five major treatment areas in dysphagia management. They are positioning, dietary modification, adaptive equipment, therapeutic techniques, alternative methods of nutrition. Proper patient positioning for eating and receiving oral medication is an important part of improving the individual swallowing process and preventing aspiration. Generally, the patient with dysphagia needs to be sitting in an upright position with the head bent slightly forward. A patient in bed needs to have the bed rolled up as far as possible. Place the individual's hip bend where the bed bends. Prop the patient with pillows. This will help keep the patient from sliding or leaning to one side. However, each patient must be considered individually. Other positions may be more effective. The patient should remain in the upright position for at least 30 to 60 minutes after eating to prevent the return of food from the stomach to the mouth, reducing the risk of choking or aspiration. Certain physical conditions will prohibit the patient from being placed in an upright position. In these cases, physicians should write an order stating that a patient should not be placed in an upright position. 
while feeding or assisting in the eating process, you should create a quiet environment free of distractions. Never rush a meal time. Sit down next to the patient so that you are positioned at eye level. This indicates your willingness to help during meal time. After the meal, assist the patient in removing food particles left in the mouth. Remove, rinse, and reinsert all dentures. Different foods cause different problems in patients with dysphagia. Some have problems with liquids, others with solids, and still others have problems with both. Lack of adequate tongue control causes many patients to have trouble swallowing thin liquids like juices and water. In these cases, the tongue isn't able to hold the liquid at the back of the mouth until the swallowing process moves from the oral to pharyngeal phase. During feeding, the use of a straw, a septo, or syringe is discouraged because the liquid hits too far back in the throat where the patient has less control. Each patient should be individually assessed to determine the most effective method for liquid intake. Adding thickening agents often helps reduce the risk of thin liquids getting into the airway by slowing the movement of the liquid in the mouth. For some patients, swallowing solid foods, especially dry and crumbly foods, may increase the risk of choking when pieces of food get into the airway. Small pieces of food may even become lodged in the side mouth folds or pockets in the pharyngeal area. Eating moist foods that will form a soft, cohesive bolus should help with this problem. Remember the goal, helping patients with dysphagia to eat effectively and swallow safely, reducing the risk of choking and getting liquids or food into the airway. By reducing an individual's risk of coughing and choking during eating, we can decrease a lot of the fear and anxiety associated with eating and swallowing. We can also assist the person with dysphagia through the use of adaptive equipment. An adaptive nosy or a cutout cup enables the patient to drink without tilting the head back. The patient, with a regular cup that is less than half full, would have to tilt the head back to drink. This position increases the risk of the liquid getting into the airway. There are various adaptive tools that help to make independent eating easier for people with swallowing problems. An occupational therapist can identify appropriate adaptive equipment that will promote individual independence. Oral muscle exercises, swallowing maneuvers, and thermal stimulation are techniques that may be used by the speech-language pathologist. Exercises help to strengthen the swallowing muscles and should reduce the time required to improve the swallowing process. Swallowing problems will affect the way patients eat and can affect their nutritional status. Alternative non-oral feedings may be used as a temporary solution to maintain nutrition while the patient participates in dysphagia treatment. A nasogastric tube and a gastrostomy tube are examples of two non-oral feeding methods. A nasogastric tube is inserted through the nose into the esophagus and into the stomach. A gastrostomy tube, G-tube or PEG, is inserted into the stomach wall. Positioning is important when a temporary non-oral method of eating is used. A patient receiving interrupted or continuous feedings must be positioned in at least a 45 degree angle up to a 90 degree angle position. A patient with interrupted feedings should remain in this position for 30 to 60 minutes following the feeding. With continuous feedings, the patient should remain at a 45 degree angle. Proper positioning prevents the return of the feeding solution from the stomach to the mouth. This helps to eliminate the risk of liquid getting into the airway. It's important for you to know the proper procedures to follow in case food does become lodged in the larynx. If the person is unable to breathe or speak, you should immediately use the Heimlich maneuver. First, stand behind the choking person. Next, wrap your arms around the person's waist. Make a fist with one hand. Place the fist with the thumb side in, just above the navel and well below the lower tip of the breastbone. Now, grasp the fist with your other hand. Remember, keep your elbows away from the victim. Then press your fist into the abdomen with a quick upward thrust. Be sure that you are in the midline of the victim's abdomen. Repeat the thrust until the obstruction is cleared. 
The ability to swallow safely is critical to our nutritional needs. It is also important to our social and health needs. Through the team approach, physicians, nurses and nursing assistants, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists and dietitians can play an invaluable role in enhancing safe swallowing. They can also work to reduce the risk of complications associated with swallowing problems. Now you have the knowledge, and now you can make a difference. <laughs>